Welcome everyone to the Collingwood Chamber of Commerce All Candidates Meeting for the Provincial Riding of Simcoe Gray. Welcome to the Royal Canadian Legion to the Normandy Room here in Collingwood. My name is John Eaton from 95.1 The Peak FM. I'm also one of the directors of the Collingwood Chamber of Commerce and I'm very pleased to be your moderator for tonight's events. Tonight we have the candidates here to discuss the issues that matter to us all here in Simcoe Gray. On June 7th, you'll have the opportunity to vote for one of these honorable citizens. We have representatives from Rogers TV, the Collingwood Connection, 97.7 The Beach, CollingwoodToday.ca, along with the Collingwood Chamber of Commerce, all cooperating to bring you this event. We'll hear from the members of the media in just a little while. I did want to point out that John Wright from the Libertarian Party had planned to be here. Unfortunately, his father recently passed away. He sends his regrets, and of course, we send our thoughts to him and his family at this time. Now we're going to hear from our candidates. We're going to ask them to deliver some opening comments. We have a timekeeper seated right off stage here, so the candidates <coughs> will be aware when they're running short on time. Each candidate will have five minutes for opening remarks. The order of speaking was chosen by draw just prior to the program this evening. And as luck would have it, our first candidate is Dan Hambly from the Liberal Party. Good evening, everybody, and I'd like to just thank you all for being here. It's uh, an important thing that uh, we do uh, in an all candidates meeting. Uh, it's part of our democracy. It's, it's important that uh, uh, the message that each of us up here has to uh, bring to you is, is amplified uh, in this uh, forum. My name is Dan Hambly. I'm your Liberal candidate for Simcoe Gray for the upcoming election in <coughs> June, and I strongly believe that it's time for a fresh perspective in Simcoe Gray. But let me tell you more precisely why I'm here. I'm here because the Liberal government has presided over an Ontario which has demonstrated outstanding economic growth, low unemployment, and is now making a conscious decision to invest in people. I personally believe that um, governments exist as a manifestation of our collective desire to make society better for people. And I believe that the greatness of any society uh, can be measured by the way in which it treats its vo most vulnerable people, the elderly, children, the sick, the poor, the oppressed, women. In Ontario, these groups, these people have been the focus of a government aiming to level the playing field in, in our society. I'm willing and ready to work hard to gain your confidence. This election, I think we can see a stark contrast of visions. Ontarians will have to select between cuts and care. Doug Ford will cut education. He'll cut health care. He'll cut government spending and cut into the greenbelt all for his friends. Doug Ford is someone who doesn't believe in climate change. He doesn't believe that government should help provide affordable housing. And he believes that he can cut his way into greater prosperity. On the other side, the liberal plans show completely opposite values and vision. Our liberal team believes in the importance of education by building new schools, by investing more in our classrooms, by hiring more teachers. And I'm spent my entire professional life in post-secondary education. You know, we invested in uh, 235,000 students for free tuition in colleges and universities, including 13,000 single mothers. And by offering free childcare to all preschoolers between the age of 2.5 and uh, kindergarten, we build a stronger Ontario with these types of policies. Our Liberal government will continue to invest more into our healthcare system because we know that cuts will diminish the quality of life for all Ontarians. This government has already built 24 hospitals and we will continue to make strategic inf infrastructure investments to renovate and build almost 50 more. We will make sure that our community-based mental health services are available to all Ontarians. We will expand our Pharmacare program. We're the first jurisdiction in North America to offer free Pharmacare for groups for people under the age of 25 and we've extended that to people over 65. We're providing dental care to those without coverage. And we'll make sure that seniors have an opportunity to grow and, and, and grow old with dignity uh, in a safe and secure and compassionate environment uh, everywhere in the province. We believe that our comprehensive opioid strategy will help us put an end to the public health crisis that needs immediate action. 
A healthy Ontario means a stronger Ontario. Your Liberal team also believes that our way to prosperity as a province is not through cuts, but through strategic investment into what Ontarians hold dear. For the past four years, our plan of investing more in the economy has worked. Ontario has led all G7 countries when it comes to economic growth. It averages 2.7% average growth over the past four years. We have the lowest unemployment rate in a generation, 5.5%. And of course, we've added 400,000 jobs under this government's leadership. We also want Ontario to be a place where economic growth is inclusive and everyone can share in its benefit. That's why we've launched the Basic Income Pilot Project, which has you know, cross-partisan support to bring support in, in our province to those who are striving for a better life. But on top of all that, these provincial issues, the region of Simcoe Gray needs more investment. We need more investment in public transit services. We need more affordable housing. We need more small and medium-sized businesses in the area. We need a new high school in Wasaga Beach. Uh, we need uh, new hospitals in our riding, both in, in Collingwood and in Alliston, for too long. In this area, we have been left behind. We deserve a strong voice in Toronto that will work hard for the priorities of Collingwood, Wasaga Beach, Blue Mountains, Clearview, Essa, New Tecumseh, Agila, Tosserantio. I'm here today to ask for your support because I strongly believe that it's time for a fresh perspective in Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Dan Hambly from the Liberal Party. Now, Jessica Perry from the Green Party. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate your support so much. Thank you. Glad to see everybody out here tonight supporting democracy and becoming engaged in local politics. I love it. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about the states. All I want to hear about is Ontario politics. Here, here. <laughs> so I just want to start the night off by telling you a little bit about why I choose to be involved with the Green Party. In my opinion, the Greens are a party that are moving towards where the puck is going and not where it's been. Greens do politics completely differently. We reject self-serving political games, accounting gimmicks, and empty promises. The Greens don't live in this fantasy land where climate change isn't an issue and our children's futures aren't a priority. In this election, the Greens are committed to a number of things. We want to make it affordable to make our homes and businesses energy efficient. We want to lower payroll taxes for local businesses. We want to ensure affordable housing. We want to provide access to mental health services. We want to implement a basic income. We want to protect our air, water, and farmland. We want to set Ontario on a pathway to 100% renewable energy. We need to invest in transit infrastructure and operations. And we also want to merge the public and Catholic school boards to create a quality education system. And you know, I love participating with the Green Party and I've been doing it for a number of years now. And the first way that I got involved with the Green Party was through the Young Greens of Canada. And I just love that the Green Party engages young voters. Like they really try hard to make it accessible for somebody young to figure out how to get involved in politics. It's time that we build a bridge that we can walk across with confidence, knowing that we have created a good future for our children. I myself have two young children, and I don't want to leave behind a province, a country that isn't sustainable for them. I, and I hope you will join me on June 7th in voting green and focusing on a future that is going to protect our children's needs, and we can all do it together in a way that benefits all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica Perry. Jim Wilson from the PC Party. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, John. Thank you for uh, coming out tonight and participating in our democratic process. I think this election is one of the most uh, important elections that uh, the voters of Ontario have ever faced. My party has a great plan. We're focused on reducing hydro rates by an additional 12% and cleaning up the hydro mess, cutting hospital wait times, putting money back into the pockets of taxpayers, job creation, and restoring accountability and trust to the provincial government. In Simcoe Gray, I will continue to fight for the redevelopment of Collingwood General Marine Hospital and Stevenson Memorial Hospital in Alliston, 
It's time for these projects to move forward to ensure our residents receive the best possible health care now and in the future. Getting the hospitals the money to continue planning for the redevelopments is my top priority. Planning for the two projects is expected to cost about $14 million per hospital. So far, the Liberal government has promised just half a million dollars for each hospital. And that announcement was two months ago and the hospitals have yet to see a dime. We need to do better. My party is also promising to end hallway health care and we're committed to building 15,000 new long-term care beds in five years <coughs> and 30,000 new beds over the next 10 years. I talk often with officials at our hospitals and I know that they're stretched to their capacity. I also know about the crisis in long-term care all across the province. The wait list for beds is now at 32,000 people. If nothing is done by three years time, 2021, the wait list will be 50,000. Our government will fix the problem and create new beds to take the strain off our hospitals and reduce wait times. We also have to do better with our approach to hospice care. I'm committed to opening the four beds currently sitting idle here at Hospice Georgian Triangle. These beds are there, they're available, and they could help our citizens, but the government won't let them open, and that's just not right. They won't let them open even if the hospice pays for the operating costs themselves. I've also uh, committed to review the short-sighted and irresponsible decision to close the Ontario Tree Seed Plant in Angus. Doug Ford supports uh, me in this matter. The Liberal government decided to close the facility with no warning and no, consider no consult consultation excuse me, with the experts, the community or industry. If I'm re-elected, we'll do a full review and look at all options to keep a treed seed plant at its current location in Angus. We're going to clean up the mess at Hydro One and use every tool available to remove Kathleen Wynne's six million dollar man and the entire board. We will put money back into your pockets by axing the carbon tax, introducing a minimum wage tax credit and cutting electricity bills by an average, for an average family by 12%. We'll restore responsibility, accountability and trust in government by conducting a fully independent outside audit of Kathleen Wynne's reckless spending. We'll bring jobs back to Ontario, stabilize industrial hydro rates, cut corporate income taxes to create jobs and to remain competitive with our neighbours and cut red tape and stifling regulation. The PC campaign uh, is campaigning for people like you and talking about issues that matter to you, like lowering hydro bills, bringing jobs back and improving health care. I think I've done a good job in the last number of years in this riding. I've been accountable, open and accessible. And on June 7th, the people of Ontario, I hope, will finally have a government that respects your tax dollars and focuses on the issues <coughs> and services that matter to real people. I respectfully ask for your support. Thank you, Jim Wilson. David Matthews of the NDP Party. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Chamber of Commerce and the media for putting this together so that we can use the democratic process to its fullest. Our policy, our, our party, wants a change for the better in Ontario. For the last 25 years, we have been flip-flopping between Liberal and Conservatives. And when one looks at what has happened in this province, nobody is further ahead. Under the Conservative government, we saw 24 hospital close, 6,000 nurses laid off. We have never recovered from that. No, ma no matter what either the Conservatives or Liberals say, we still have not recovered from that. And how can you trust Doug Ford when this is a man who believes in cuts? The first, but our two biggest budget expenditures are education and hospitals, and they are the two areas where he will make his cuts to make his $6.1 billion <clears throat> that he wants to use. I, I honestly believe, you know, that as a government, our tax dollars should be going to services. They should not be going to corporations. Doug Ford and the Conservatives have openly stated they are going to cut corporation tax by another one and a half percent. These are the richest co companies in this province and they're not paying their fair share. He's also stated that he wants to kill the carbon tax, something that he has not the power to do because the federal government is going to enforce that. And I would sooner see my tax dollars go to Ontario than to the federal government. The one thing that I would like to see, and I hope Jim can answer this question tonight, is where they're going to make their cuts. Under the Harris government, he was right up front about it, where he's going to make his cuts. 
You know, Tim Hudak, even though he wasn't elected, still came through with where he was going to make his cuts. Well, I would like to know, and I think everybody in Ontario would like to know, where Doug Ford is going to make his cuts. He's lowering corporate taxes. He's going to lower the taxes of middle income people. This is all revenue that we have to have for services, so something has to go. Our party thinks the direct opposite. Our platform is roughly the same as the Liberals, but unlike the Liberals, we are going to act on this stuff. The Liberals have had 15 years to clean up our hospitals so pe patients aren't being treated in hallways. They have done nothing. They brought in free education to 20% of the people that live in Ontario. We're going to change that and make post-secondary education free for everybody, which it should be. They brought in Pharmacare for 20% of the people in Ontario. If you're not under 25, you don't get it. We're bringing it in for everybody. We're also going to bring in denture care. These are all programs that are going to help people. We're going to help seniors. We're going to make their lives better. We're going to open up senior like homes for them. We're, going, we're all kinds of things. The Liberals have talked this for years and they've never acted on it. If you were to really look at what they've done, they did uh, underfunded uh, the hospitals last year, our medical system, by $300 million, turned around and claimed that they put money in, but they cut services. If you, uh, any uh, people that have children that need services have found that they've been dropped off. We can't have this. We need those services. That's what our tax dollars are for. The Liberals have abused that. They've wasted money. They've uh, tried to, uh, excuse, <coughs> excuse me, they've taken money out of education. It's a shame when, you're, when the teachers in these schools have to buy supplies with their own money. We pay a lot of taxes, and I'd like to know where this money is going. We want to change all that. We've seen the Liberals' actions this, this week by closing the seed plant and not telling anybody, and really no reason for cleaning, for closing it. You know, the, we have a lot of um, for nonprofit organizations that plant seeds. They buy them there. The wind government has decided they can go to the private enterprise, private companies, to make money to buy these seeds. This is unacceptable. The other thing is Mr. Ford wants to sell marijuana in the corner stores where we want to make sure that it's strictly governed. Thank you, and I hope that I can get your support come June the 7th. Thank you, David Matthews. Now the, uh, we'll move to the questions from our candidates on the media panel. I think each of them will, will have an opportunity to ask a question of one of our candidates. That candidate will have two minutes to respond to the individual question. The other candidates will then have one minute each to respond if they so choose. We'll start with our first media question from John Edwards from the Collingwood Connection. I just yell? Hello? Oh, you're not... You just yell? No, we're going to go get you the microphone. Oh, then we have to yeah, pass it back. Yeah, we have to pull the mic here. <laughs> you get them both. You need a mic runner. You have to talk in both of them. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this question is for David Matthews. Uh, every year, uh, parents, like my wife and I, uh, are given a list every year of school of things we have to provide. And I have friends who are teachers, and you spoke about it. Every year they're given, they have, uh, they spend hundreds, some, some of them thousands of dollars of their own money for education. Um, things like arts programs and music programs and schools are pretty much gone, things that I had when I was a kid. Um, things that really help kids learn. Um, yet the bureaucracy seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, what are your plans for education and do they include a single school board so that that savings can be put back into frontline education. Um, what our party proposes to do is invest heavily in education system. Uh, we want to build more schools. We want to change the formula for building high schools. Because right now Wasaga Beach is looking for a high school. They can't build it under the present formula, so that would have to be changed. We're going to put a moratorium on any school closures. 
We want to look at bringing back schools to rural Ontario. Rural Ontario over the last 10, 15 years has taken a beating, beating on school closures. We want to put sufficient money into the schools so that they can bring back music programs, art programs, all these programs that the Liberals have cut out of education, which our children need. We, we hopefully, if we are elected, we're going to look at other countries and what they're doing with their school systems that are working effectively. Uh, if we take some of the Norwegian countries, they teach everything that we do, their kids are excelling, and they don't put half the money into their education system that we do. And this is something that we really have to work, uh, look at. Um, we also want to make sure that the teachers are satisfied with what they're doing, and we want to make the education system accountable. As far as the school boards go, my firm belief is that we should have a joint school board between Catholic and public not two separate school boards to save money. Thank you. Thank you, David Matthews. Jim Wilson, would you like to respond? Yeah, good question, uh, John. Um, I don't think any of our platforms have cuts to education. Um, uh, in fact, I've looked at all of them and, and no one's saying we're gonna cut frontline education. We do, as, as Dave uh, absolutely said, there's a, there's a real problem with the funding formula. Kathleen Wynne has, uh, has acknowledged that. It's just they haven't fixed it over the past few years. Um, we don't hear the same complaints in Toronto when I'm down at Queen's Park and talking to parents about the school supplies. They still have the music programs, they still have the shops, they still have everything. They seem to be well funded at the Toronto District School Board to the point where they're scandal ridden half the time with all the money they have. Um, we don't have that luxury here. It's uh, pretty, pretty lean. Uh, but we are top heavy. I mean, I can remember a time when we just had a handful of superintendents. Now we have superintendents. They all have assistants. The assistants have assistants. So you always have to try and find efficiencies and drive the money to the classroom. I'm not sure having one great big monopoly school board in this province would be a great idea. Just think when they go on strike all at once. <laughs> Thank you, Jim Wilson. Jessica Perry. Thank you. So to answer your question directly, the Green Party is definitely committed to merging the public and Catholic school boards. We think that that's going to bring a better quality of education. We're going to reduce classroom sizes. I can relate to you because my daughter, Olivia, she'll be starting kindergarten this year and we just went to her school orientation on Wednesday. Heartbreak. <laughs> and the teacher actually told us, you know, it would be great if you could donate X amount of supplies and I was shocked I'm like really we have to you know donate paper and pencils this stuff doesn't come accommodating to classrooms so yes the Green Party is committed to merging the two uh, school boards and uh, hopefully the quality of education will reduce these striking thank you Jessica Dan Hambly thanks um, good question I was a product of the Ontario school system in the 1980s and I did feel like that was the era of plenty um, and noticed, um, you know, significant cuts in the in the 1990s. Um, but due to the Ontario Liberal government's investments, Ontario Ontario's education system. I don't like when people talk it down. It's one of the best uh, in the world. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't room for improvement, but you know, this year alone, it means an investment of 24 billion. It's a 3.5 billion dollar increase since uh, since 2013. Uh, and it's thanks to these investments that uh, our high school graduation rate has risen to 86.5%. That's up 18% under our government. Um, and Ontario ranks, Ontario students continue to rank high on international standards tests. So, uh, but I, I think there is more to do and I'm certainly, uh, I come from an education background. I would certainly advocate for um, improvement in, uh, in areas that uh, I think are uh, deficient. Thank you, Dan. Our next media question comes from Marion McLeod from 97.7 The Beach. My question is for Jim Wilson. And uh, I would like the other uh, candidates to answer uh, inserting the name of their leader in, the, uh, in their answer. Uh, so Doug Ford is an accused drug dealer. He says he didn't know children who would be living in a group home that was planned for his neighborhood in Etobicoke would actually be leaving the house. He ordered an audit at Toronto City Hall that showed no waste to cut. He supported uh, four years of insanity at Toronto City Hall. He lied for his brother and 
ordered an audit again that found nothing. He won his party's leadership with the support of the ultra right wing Tanya Granik Allen, who he then promptly threw under the bus. How can you support your leader? Well, uh, thank you for the question, I guess. Marion, I know you don't like the guy, but holy mackerel. I don't know uh, how much of that is, is true or not. I mean, I can only give my honest assessment. I didn't know Doug before he ran for leader. I uh, supported uh, Christine, but I've gotten to know him. Uh, he's been on the road a lot, so you don't have a lot of personal contact with him. And what I can see is um, people love him. Uh, he was elected on a Saturday, and we had a unity rally with one day's notice on the Monday night two months ago, and there were 2,200 people there. Ladies and gentlemen, in my 27 years, I've never been to a political rally with 2,200 people there. Um, and they're from all walks of life, all religions. It was at the Toronto uh, International Centre at the airport. He, uh, he went up to Thunder Bay, he got 700 people in Thunder Bay, uh, all walks in life. I remember turning the sod when I was health minister on Thunder Bay Hospital, and there were 24 people, and I think four of them were my staff. Um, he came into the cafeteria one day, not that he doesn't go to the uh, members' cafeteria, he went to the uh, huge cafeteria that holds about a thousand people across the uh, uh, road from the Pink Palace and I've never seen people line up for selfies and civil servants of all stripes <laughs> want to shake his hand. So I'm assuming these are the people that know him. These are the people that live in Toronto. They, uh, they, they grew, some would have grown up in Etobicoke. They know his family. They've been in politics for 30 years. I served with his dad for five years during the Harris government. Uh, his dad was an extremely honorable person. Uh, from what I've seen of Doug, he's an honorable, compassionate. He explained to the media that uh, he, once he, he had clashes with the media down at City Hall, but he said, I did that because I was always defending my brother. I didn't always know what my brother was up to, but where I come from, defending my brother is a virtue. And since he said that to our Queen's Park media, they haven't opened that issue again. Thank you, Jim. David Matthews. Oh, sorry, Jessica Perry. <laughs> So, I'm not really sure how to answer that, but I'll let you know that the leader of the Green Party of Ontario is Mike Schreiner. He's uh, running in Guelph. Uh, he ran in Guelph in the last provincial election as well. And we hope to see him elected at Queen's Park on June 7th. And not Doug Ford. <laughs> Dan Hambly. So, Kathleen Wynne, um, I, she came on my radar. Uh, some years ago, um, um, in, in 2013, <laughs> uh, so I have had the um, incredible experience of having a, a, a sort of um, behind-the-scenes look at how government uh, operates, and I've been in a very privileged, I think, and unique uh, position uh, because Maggie, her uh, her youngest daughter, is my my spouse, and uh, I th I think Kathleen Wynne is a brilliant woman. I think uh, she comes from an education background, and, and so do I. So we identified on on that level, but also ideologically, we're very very similar, and uh, that's why I'm here. I'm here to defend her and her record, and uh, and uh, I shall continue to do that. Thank you, Dan. David Matthews. Um, anybody who's followed Doug Ford's career knows that sometimes you've got to wonder if there's a few screws loose. This is a man who openly stated that he doesn't want immigrants going to the north to work there. We have to take care of our own before we bring immigrants into this province. This province was built on immigrants, and I dare say that everybody sitting in this room, somewhere along the line, you were an immigrant. This is the way the man talks. Then when the media approached him about it, he said he didn't say it. This man is continually saying things and then backtracking on it. If he's doing it now before the election, what's he gonna be like when he's elected? This is one of the reasons you have to look at the parties, not the people who are running. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next media question will come from Erica Engel from CollingwoodToday.ca. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. My question is for um, Dan Hambly. Where do you think residents of Simcoe Gray encounter the most provincial red tape, and what needs to be done about it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> 
I, um, um, I believe that in virtually uh, all aspects of government, there are uh, there are red tape. There's red tape that um, can be cut, um, but uh, specifically, I don't um, I don't have an answer um, for you. But I might need to think about it a bit bit longer. David Matthews. I think one of the problems that we have in Simcoe Gray and we have all over Ontario, especially rural Ontario, is that towns are not allowed, they don't have the power to get things done. We see that with the Green Energy Act where if you want to put windmills in, we saw it in Stainer, where they can put these windmills in, it costs the people of Stainer, Collingwood and that over a million dollars to fight it to get it stopped. I'm a firm believer that the municipal board should be scrapped. There has to be a better system so that towns have the authority and the power to make decisions on their own of what's going on inside that town. Thank you, David. Jim Wilson. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't blame Dan for not coming up right away because p people have their own definitions of red tape. I mean, uh, a good example brought to me recently was co-op dealer dealing with farmers in order to sell pesticides. He doesn't have one permit. He's got nine permits. He deals with five ministries. He deals with uh, three federal departments, and he can remember the day when he got one permit to sell pesticides and one day of training for his staff, not days after days after days. So it drives the cost up, drives the cost up of food. You want to have food safety, but it's the farmers themselves telling us it's gone crazy. And housing. It can take uh, a minimum of two years to get a permit to build a house. Now, how are you going to have affordable housing when all that money's tied up, the developer's money's tied up, the price of housing goes up because of the red tape. So we hear from the housing sector, right from Toronto to Collingwood, that uh, they're drowning in red tape and waiting for approvals. Jessica Perry. Yeah, I see a lot of red tape in Simcoe Gray when it comes to a lot of community issues. For starters, I mean, we have residents in Tottenham who deal with water quality levels that are that of close to a third world country. They have to bathe their children in water that comes out brown from their taps, and they're told filters can be put in place to fix the situation. Well, it's just not true. We have to force an expansion of a green belt because the amount of urban sprawl in this area is just atrocious. We have to you know, close down one of a kind tree facility Angus for God knows what reasons, they're beyond me. We have to, you know, there's fill that we're accepting from the GTA, we're throwing in everyone's backyards and nobody's talking about why and we're not getting rid of it. We have communities that are lacking, the Sega Beach doesn't even have a beachfront anymore, the whole community is dead, it doesn't even have a high school. There's tons of red tape when it comes to this riding and this riding is huge and it consists of so many small niche communities that need, you know, to be looked at, they need that local economy to come back. Thank you, Jessica. Our very next media question will come to us from Penny Skelton from Rogers Television. They don't usually give me two microphones. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here this evening and thank you for taking our questions sort of out of the blue. Mine is every election we hear voters, voter, voters speak to candidates and they say, if elected, we're gonna change things when we get to Queen's Park. If you believe this promise, what specific three things would you try to change in your first year? Oh, Jessica, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for that question. So yeah, you know, that does come up a lot. If I get elected, this is what I'm gonna do, that's what I'm gonna do personally. For me, the three main issues that the Green Party definitely stands for is one, expanding the Green Belt. I grew up in Beaton. My husband grew up in Beaton. Our families still live in Beaton, yet we can't afford to buy a house there because the amount of development is just astronomical. So one, put like requirements on expanding that Green Belt. The amount of urban sprawl is just insane. Two, we need to merge those public and Catholic school boards. I can't even stress how you know anxious I am about sending my daughter to school and the quality of education is going to be far less than what I was able to get when I went to elementary school and that wasn't that long ago so it's changed dramatically in such a short period of time. Um, and number three, I mean we have to protect our prime 
you know, living resources, air, water, farmland. We have to make that number one. It's just, we need to stop Nestle from coming into all these little communities and draining our water and putting it in bottles and selling it back to us. It's insane. We need to protect prime one agricultural farmland and stop putting houses on it. And we need to, you know, yeah, put a carbon tax. Air is, you know, vital for everybody and we all need to breathe it. So we all better start protecting it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Dan Hambly. Okay, so we um, were one of the few jurisdictions in the world to um, to bring about the basic income pilot, and uh, I think that if I'm elected, that's one of the things I'd like to vigorously pursue. The basic income pilot, like I mentioned before, has cross-partisan support. Um, you know, if you look at the Dauphin, Manitoba example. Um, I think there's a, a lot of good that can be done when you increase um, people's standards of living. Um, the next thing, of course, is, uh, is, is trying to grow the middle class. I mean, our economy uh, can only survive if we have people who are, uh, are able to buy stuff. Uh, and, and so by bumping the minimum wage, you know, there are 30,000 people in Simcoe Gray who make less than $30,000 an hour, which is about 15 bucks an hour. When you, when you bump the, up the minimum wage, you are decreasing the gap between the rich and the poor. And, and it helps the, the middle and working class be able Thank to- Thank you, Dan. Okay. <laughs> Have you can pass the mic to Jim Wells. Yeah, you know, very specifically, get moving uh, as quickly as possible on getting these hospitals uh, redeveloped, uh, long overdue, and uh, we need to get it done. Jessica mentioned it. I'm meeting recently with the uh, town of New Tecumseh, and we've got the water pipeline from here down to Alliston, and now it's in Beaton, and we ha desperately have to get it to Tottenham, and unfortunately, the municipality's plan is to do that in three years. We need to do it right away. The uh, water quality there is not good and hasn't been good for some time. We've done our part, the province did its part, the pipeline's there, we need to get it down to Tottenham. Um, finish the hospital, uh, hospice funding here in town and uh, reopen the seed plant in Angus. David Matthews. Well, I think one of the first things, uh, if I get elected that I'm going to fight hard to get uh, in is the uh, pharmacare and dental care. I think that's a priority. I think any we have to get in $12 a day daycare too many families are wasting up to 70% of their income on daycare for kids. I think that's outrageous. I also believe that we have to get working on helping seniors. Our seniors are living, we have seniors that live well below the poverty line. We have to change that. We have to get better facilities for them. We have to get better medical care for them. They're the prim primary things that I'm going to fight for right off the bat. Thank you, David Matthews. Another media question, this time again from John Edwards from the Collingwood Connection. Thank you. Um, this has been mentioned, but I had the question written down before, so I'm going to ask it. Um, uh, Hospice Georgian Triangle uh, residents in this community in the South Georgian Bay raised uh, about $2.4 million to build four beds. It's about a 4,000 square foot expansion. I spoke with them and they said that those beds have been are empty and have been for a year. They're not allowed to self-fund them. Um, the province has chosen to to build beds and uh, to fund beds in a really impenetrable Uh This question's for Jessica. Sorry. Do you plan to fight uh, for Hospice Georgian Triangle to allow them to open those beds? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. I mean, I think the obvious answer is yes, and I can't understand a government that would not want to fund that. Um, or, I mean, if the beds are available, why are they sitting empty? I'm not sure, but it's something that the Green Party would definitely be uh, fighting for. Um, I mean, I can only protest the importance of a hospice. My uh, my husband's grandmother uh, just passed away a few months ago and she was at the Alliston Hospice there and uh, all of the donations that we received from her funeral went to the Alliston Hospice and I can only uh, protest personally to that fact that if I were elected at Queen's Park I would definitely make that a part of my priority. Dan Hambly. So 
I think hospices are a value that's embedded into this, uh, the Liberal government. We've seen it, um, you know, before uh, the Liberal government took office, um, there was virtually no state support for, uh, government support for hospices. It was up to individual um, initiatives. So we actually uh, were the ones who started to fund hospices. We. Uh, fully funded, well, we funded uh, the Allison Hospice recently, um, and it's my understanding that the funding is uh, is actually set to come to those four beds. Um, um, it's just not been announced yet, from what I understand. So um, it's a value that I think is embedded in our government, and, uh, and, we, are, uh, and we are set to, I think, uh, support that. Jim Wilson? Well, it's good to hear that because it has, has been a, a year, a frustrating year. Um, the government has turned down, John mentioned self-funding, so if we raise the funds in the community to uh, open the beds, pay for the operational funding, they've turned the hospital down saying, can we use them for um, uh, alternative level of care beds since we don't have enough nursing home beds, could we, could we fund the hospice for those four beds to turn them into nursing home beds, um, uh, which would take pressure off the hospital. Um, just about everything, there's been four different solutions put forward and for some reason the government won't do it. Uh, I'm glad to hear that they, they might do it soon. Um, but you might not be in office, so we might have to do it. <laughs> David Matthews. Well said, Jim. Um, yeah, I, I would support that 100%. There, there's no denying that and that, that is part of our platform. Uh, the Liberals talk a very good story, but as you've seen over the last 15 years, they don't deliver. This problem has been going on for over a year, and there was never any action on it. Now there's an election, they wake up and they say, oh, we better do something about it. That's always been in the Liberal game plan. Every election they make promises and they don't come through with it. Our party will come through with it. That much I can assure you. Thank you, David Matthews. Our next media question comes from Marion McLeod from 97.7 The Beach. I'll direct mine to, uh, to Dan Hamley and then to the others. Uh, in the course of the last answers to the question that John asked, I uh, went to the Ministry of Education's website and looked up this sex ed curriculum. So I'm assuming since it's a campaign topic that's been discussed that you all have looked it up as well. So tell me one thing that uh, your kid will learn about their sexuality in grade six. Um, first of all, I think that uh, if you look around the world at the places uh, where sex education is both uh, early and comprehensive. These are the places in the world that uh, have the lowest cases of teen pregnancy. They have the lowest cases of STI. They have the lowest cases, and this is really important, the lowest cases of sexual assault, places like Netherlands. Uh, so this is crucially important that we, that we uh, bring early and comprehensive sex sexual education to, uh, to children. Um, and in grade six, I believe, I believe one of the things that uh, they learn in grade six is about um, appropriate relationships, and uh, and that's uh, building on, of course, information that they have been introduced. That in grade one, they're learning about uh, the names of body parts. That's really important because. Um, you take away the sort of stigma and the giggles associated with uh, with uh, the naming of certain body parts that might happen later in life, and and so language is learning the language is I think really important. And uh, but it, but I think in grade six, uh, healthy relationships is an aspect of the curriculum that they learn. Jessica Perry. Oh, what a question. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, my only hope can be that when my daughter is that old to be in grade six, you know, she will be learning about personal relationship boundaries. Um, I do know that it's, I don't know, but the way I personally feel about it is that, you know, 
maybe introducing such an intense sexual curriculum at such a young age may not be the best road to go, but definitely introducing awareness, boundaries, body parts, things like that. It's definitely on the slate for the Green Party. We're totally 100% on board with that. I mean, I talk very sternly to my daughter. She understands what body parts are. We don't have nicknames for them. You know, when it comes a time to speak freely, I want her to know what she's talking about. So perfect. In grade six, personal relationships, boundaries, I'm on board with that. Jim Wilson. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, no one's talking about getting rid of the sex education uh, curriculum, and I, I agree with both previous speakers. There's lots of stuff in there that's absolutely necessary, and, and I think what happens is this issue gets sensationalized by media and others. Um, just there are parents who do question some of the curriculum at different ages and whether what's being taught is age appropriate and whether they were consulted. and. Uh, you know, the consultation, the government would say was extensive, but it was one parent who was on the parent council for each school, and they weren't allowed to hold public meetings, and, uh, and they reported into Queen's Park. Um, I never saw any of those reports. We never had a discussion of the sex ed curriculum, not once on the floor of the legislature. So there are people out there saying, we want a voice, we want a review, but we're going to have sex education curriculum. It's crucial. David Matthews. Like I told, like by the way, I don't know what is on the grade six curriculum, okay? But the one thing that concerns me about it, and like Jim touched on it, is that parents weren't really consulted. It's parents' kids that are taking this. I firmly believe in sexual education in schools. It should be in schools. But parents should be consulted, advised. The Board of Education, the Ministry of Education should be taking the advice and input from parents the way this, these things are going to be taught and at what ages. And the Liberal government just, once again, does things on their own and they do not do thorough uh, uh, information sessions with parents. Thank you, David Matthews. Another media question from Erica Engel from CollingwoodToday.ca. <laughs> Do you want me to ask you the answer? Does anyone want to know what's on the sex ed curriculum for grade six? She really wants to tell you. Yes? Here you go. Uh, stereotyping, uh, respect for others, appropriate reactions to other people's stereotyping and bullying, and uh, the facts about gender identity. Um, so my question is for David Matthews. Um, overall, the rate of salary and wages and um, income for residents of Simcoe Gray is increasing, if it's increasing, uh, much, much, much slower than, than cost of living. Um, an extra $3 on my paycheck isn't going to make a difference if gas is $1.30 a liter, my grocery bill is $20 more, car insurance goes up, um, internet goes up, all of that sort of thing. So it's starting to feel like we won't be able to afford a provincial government much longer. <laughs> so um, when do the spending increases stop and where is the sustainable fiscal plan like the one each Ontarian is, request, is required to put in place to manage their own home? <coughs> That's a good question. Well, one of our policies is to make Ontario more affordable for everybody. One of the first things we're going to do is put guidelines on gas increases for your car. If you go out to Nova Scotia, whatever the gas, price of gasoline is on Monday, it will be that price all the way through. And the gas companies have to justify the increases. That's what we want to do in Ontario. Uh, we also want to bring in, because the insurance companies in this province do not want to listen to the government. They keep jacking up your, your rates even though they say they are lowering them. They lower your coverage and charge you higher premiums on that coverage. So we want to bring in provincial car insurance like they have in Saskatchewan to make things cheaper. We're going to lower the hydro rates. We're going to bring hydro back into public ownership, which it should have been in the first place. We're going to stop the privatization of all these things. We're going to bring in affordable housing. We're going to set up a system where people who want to retrofit their homes to make them more energy efficient we're going to set up a system where they can get no interest loans to do that. We want the carbon tax we are going to actually bring back to the consumers through. If you want to put a heat pump in your home, we're going to help you do that. These are the things that are going to make 
affordable things in Ontario. We're also going to bring in a healthy food program where Ontarians will be Ontario people will be buying Ontario food at reasonable prices. Thank you. Jim Wilson. Yeah, I think unlike at least the other two main parties, along with the Green Party, but we are going to very shortly have out our fully costed plan, which does bring us to a balanced budget eventually, not in the first uh, little while, because we think the deficit is uh, is quite higher, much higher than being disclosed. We do a daycare program, 75% up to $6,750 a year for 0 to 15, not just uh, from uh, uh, 2 to 5. Um, for everybody, and it's whatever type of daycare you can you can get, as long as it's a healthy daycare. Uh, getting rid of the carbon tax will take 4.3 cents off the price of gasoline at the pumps right away. Um, we are going to lower. Your, we have a fully costed hydro plan to lower an additional 12 percent. Uh, but I think it is important. We're spending 12 billion dollars a year. It's the second biggest expenditure for government on interest. That interest doesn't go back to the economy in Ontario. It's basically going to China and New York. That's $12 billion we could be spending on, I mean, our hospitals are less than a billion dollars for two new hospitals. You Thank could have you, 24 Jim hospitals in one year. Uh, if you, uh, Thank you, Jim. On interest. Thank you. Jessica Perry. Well, thank you for the question. The Green Party has released a cost of platform. Jim, if you want to take a look at it. Um, we are focusing on affordable housing. Find the, time. <laughs> the Green Party wants to put a minimum of 20% of developments sectioned off for lower income families. So when you have somebody like Mattamy Homes comes into a community, they put this great massive development in there. We want to make sure a minimum of 20% of that development is sectioned off for lower income families. We do support a basic income as well as Dan had mentioned before. Rather than focusing so much on Green Party heavy carbon tax, we want to instead make it affordable for people to live sustainably. Example, purchase a solar panel and no HST on it. Something that will make it cheaper for the manufacturer to produce and get it into the homes quicker and faster and more affordable for people. Thank you. Thanks. And um, I would say first, um, increasing wages is one way to make things more affordable by having the money in the first place. And like I said before, 30,000 people in Simcoe Gray have less than, uh, make less than $30,000 a year. So increasing the minimum wage was a crucial step uh, to providing a living wage, uh, which in Simcoe County is $17.85 an hour. Uh, the basic income, I think, pilot project, um, you know, to my mind, it, it almost doesn't even need to be a pilot. I know that we, we know that it works. The data shows that it works. Um, pharmacare is really important. My, you know, I grew up in a, in a household that was aware of this gap in our healthcare system. People couldn't afford their, their prescription medications. They were walking away from them. They get sicker. They end up in eMERGE, and that costs us money on the back end. So front-ending things. Childcare uh, is, is an affordability issue as well. I mean, and it's good for the economy. For every dollar you put into childcare from the government, it comes back $7 uh, to, to the economy. And of course, um, affordable housing is a crucial, crucial issue in this part of Thank the you, writing. Dan Hamley. Thank you, Dan. Our next media question will be coming from Penny Skelton at Rogers Television. I kind of like two mics, I really do. My question is for Jim Wilson, and I wrote it down because there's technical stuff in here. Farmers throughout this riding of Simcoe Gray continue to face huge livestock losses and they receive no compensation from this program. Please state your position regarding the Ontario Wildlife Damage Compensation Program, and should that compensation be retroactive? Well, thank you, Penny. Uh, uh, if you go to my website, you'll see a video of one of the last questions I asked before Parliament adjourned for the election was exactly this, this question. Uh, I Oh, I got it from a farmer too, <laughs> and they asked me, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture actually lobbied me to, to ask the question, so um, we asked, uh, there's been a problem in terms of about 75% of the claims uh, for uh, uh, predatory animals that have been shot, um, they changed the criteria for some reason, and they no longer take the farmer's word for it, or the clerk of the township's word for it, as they used to, um, they say now that if there's no blood or there's no carcass left of the sheep that was apparently you know eaten by the coyote or whatever um, they won't pay well we used to take the farmers word for it 
and it was a lot more lenient the program so we have committed to to re-examining that and it's been a full 18 months that this has been going on so we've committed that where we can find proof we can't just open the purse strings to anybody that makes the claim but we should be taking more of our farmers word for it they're the salt of the earth they've never abused the program there was no accusation of abuse of the program and we're not quite sure why the government clamped down in the way that they did jessica perry yeah, I definitely uh, surprisingly agree with Jim on that uh, subject. Uh, we definitely should be re-examining that. I'm not sure why um, that situation would have changed. I mean, I can understand with budget cuts and wanting to take money away from our farmers and putting them into the hands of the corporation, of course. But I mean, when you think about a farmer living locally and feeding our local economy and communities, I mean, we don't want to take things away from them. We want to give to them. So that would definitely be on the Green Party of Ontario's platform. And I would love to talk to more rural farmers about that issue and see where we can help out. Dan Hambly. So Ontario continues to be a leader in uh, in business risk management programs for farmers uh, committing we've committed 230 million uh, annually to help farmers cover loss and damage due to risks that are absolutely beyond their control that's a liberal initiative I think it's an important one to maintain I support it entirely um, our farm and food sector is an economic powerhouse in uh, in this province it generates more than 37 billion to our uh, economy annually and of course it provides us the food that uh, that we eat um, if elected I certainly would uh, would uh, support all policies that are friendly to farmers and uh, and that uh, make it easier for farmers to uh, to do what they need to do. Thank you, Dan. David Matthews. Well, you know the farmers in this province have been getting a beaten beating for the last 15 years with crop insurance, with uh, predators killing their livestock and that and. Once again, the Liberals have always said that they're going to help farmers, but really when you talk to farmers, they must be helping some other farmers because they're not helping the farmers around here. But this is something that has to be seriously looked at because farming, the farming industry, you don't see the kids taking over their family farms anymore because it's getting too expensive. And we need a government to help the farmers and to keep our farming industry healthy. Thank you, David. Let's give a round of applause to our media panel and thank them for joining us here tonight. I'd also like to thank you in uh, thanking Roberto Labrandi, our impromptu mic passer. Thank you, Roberto. It's uh, now time for me to have some questions from you, the members of the audience here at the Royal Canadian Legion here in Collingwood. Uh, thank you for submitting these. I'm gonna draw a few just by random. Now, this will be the first time I'm reading them, so wish me luck. Here's a question. It's from, I believe it's Claire Capon. I hear from my granddaughter that the education budget has been cut in the arts, music, science departments. Why is that? Uh, maybe we can start uh, with you, Dan Hamlet. Uh, yeah, pass yeah. the mic there. That's uh, news to me, obviously. I, um, growing up, arts was really important to me. I'm a classically trained singer, but I got my start really in, in the drama section uh, of my high school, uh, and it gave me above all, you know, confidence. And uh, so I'm, you know, these are, the arts are just uh, as important uh, to me as, as the other subjects in schools. Uh, I'm not aware of any cuts um, to, to those types of programs, um, but I certainly wouldn't uh, be in support of, of, of those types of cuts, that's for certain. Jessica Perry, where do you stand on funding arts in school? I mean, I think we're all on the same page. We don't want to cut, you know, n essential classrooms and education from our schools. So, I mean, we're all on the same page with funding schools. The Green Party has made it very clear in order to do that, the only way is to merge the public and Catholic school boards. In today's day and age where there are a number of religions that are in our modern day, why is the government choosing to fund an only Catholic school board? It's insane. Jim Wilson. <clears throat> well, it probably is because we have a constitution that you'll have to change, which might be a little difficult. Um, <laughs> well, they've already done the that fact of the matter is, uh, <laughs> I, I don't blame Kathleen Wynne. I think her heart's in the right place with respect to education. She's changed over the years. but. They have pumped billions, about six billion more into education since uh, the Liberals came to office. And the population hasn't gone up that much 
So we need to take whatever whoever gets in needs to take a good look at where the money's going, because we pumped the government has pumped money into special ed. They pump money into extracurricular activities. We shouldn't be stealing from the art department. We shouldn't have to be stealing from the art department to pay for the rest of the education. So, I mean, I've sat there for a number of years, and I, I, I wish in some days they'd make me education minister, because I would love to get to the bottom of uh, that amount, huge amount of expenditure, and yet our math scores are in grade six are stuck. In some areas, we're going back compared to other provinces. Thank so you, we Jim. really need an education Thank you, Jim Wells. overhaul. Um, I was one of the original uh, founders of um, an education uh, committee. And the one thing about our education system is that we follow the American style of education in our schools. The American style has failed in the public school sector. It's failing in Ontario now. The money is there. It's how that money has to be used. That's why if we are elected, we're going to look at countries that are successful in education. And we have to use some formula to get our schools back on track so our kids do get a good quality education. Thank you, David Matthews. David, you can hang on to that microphone. Our other question from our audience member. Does your party support green belt expansion to protect vulnerable water sources, green spaces, and farmland? Our party does not support any type of buildings on the green, on the green belt. We want to expand it. We want to not only protect the Greenbelt area, but we want to protect number one, two, and three farmland. We are losing our valuable farmland at an enormous rate. You know, we have to do something about the sprawl of communities. Um, the Greenbelt is very sensitive. We have got to stop building on it. This is something as we saw Ford made a backroom deal to have the development put right on the Greenbelt. So this is something that we it should be enshrined that nobody can build on. Yeah, I mean, the Liberal government has uh, taken chunks of the Green Belt 17 times. Uh, they've made adjustments to the Green Belt. Uh, when Doug made that comment, I think he had in his head, because he's a Toronto City Councillor at one time, where they made changes to the Green Belt. Uh, what, what he was looking at is housing affordability, uh, and a big thing of what people that are in the housing business tell us, real estate agents and builders, is they need land. But I agree with Dave. We're, co we're consuming... We're consuming land uh, hand over fist in a, there's no plan. And, and, and we're the first riding after the green belt and the government put in a green belt and never put in a plan for us. So everybody wants to build in the south end of Simcoe and now up here in Mississauga Beach and Collingwood. And you know, when you're, the, when you're the member, it's pressure every day to try and save the farmland around here. So to answer the question, yes, the Green Party is committed to expanding and protecting the existing Green Belt. I know that there's some proposal right now to expand Highway 26 across the Green Belt and connect it with the 404. That is a mistake, and the Green Party would definitely not allow that proposal to move forward. We need to protect the lands that our children developed, lived on and have grown up on. If developers want to come in and develop on our land, let them build up instead of out. No more mansions. No more of these big one-acre property lots. Build them up instead of spreading them out. Thank you. So Kathleen Wood has come out and said that she uh, and the Liberal government will expand uh, the Green Belt, uh, and it makes perfect sense, especially in our riding. I mean, most of Simcoe County, the water that uh, we consume, that we need, comes from the ground, uh, and it needs to be protected. But I think uh, um, just as important, I think, is uh, I, I, growth, it seems to me, is inevitable, but it's how we grow, I think, that we need to, uh, to think really hard about. I think intensification is a crucially important aspect of smart growth, infilling. Uh, you know, uh, I'm living in Allison, you can see uh, the sprawl that's happened. It's not good for uh, the tax base, it's not, uh, it's not good for the environment. Um, infilling, having uh, smaller properties on existing municipal uh, ground, I think, is the way that we should be uh, looking at uh, development going forward. Thank you. One final question from you, the audience here at the Collingwood Legion. Where do you personally believe that the new Collingwood Hospital should be built? 
<laughs> on which side of the road? <laughs> I believe that it should be built where the most need is and where the residents of the community most agree that it should be built. <coughs> I know there's a definite need for a hospital up here. A friend of mine just went off of work. She's about to have a baby in a week, and she can't get any good health care up here because there's not a hospital that's not big enough, but quality uh, is definitely an issue. And, you know, she has to travel all the way to Barrie. She lives in Wasega. It's a big issue. So we definitely need a quality hospital in Collingwood and the place where she should go. You know. Yeah, well, from the beginning, which is 10 years ago, uh, we, uh, we planned that new $33 million highway to go to the new hospital and to the Georgian, Tri uh, Georgian College campus. The vision is to uh, have a healthcare campus there, ladies and gentlemen, so we need the 56 acres, not the 14 acres that's available downtown. The Georgian uh, College will transfer more into nursing and paramedic teaching in that building, and they'll be able to practice at the hospital. We want to build the first modern mid-sized hospital in Canada and it's a teaching hospital, a fully teaching hospital. It's what's lacking in our health care system. I know that as a former Minister of Health. You know, a lot of our doctors get trained in the big teaching hospitals in Toronto. The trauma case comes in, they pick up the phone and they call Code White and the team comes in and looks after it. We need to train our doctors in a hospital where they can do everything and they're capable of doing everything and the, and the resources are there for them. That's been the vision for the past 10 years. The hospital boards come on board in the last five years. The people, by the way, thank you. We've almost raised thank our you, local share for that hospital. David Madden. Well, I personally don't care where it's built as long as it's built. It's about time we do get a new hospital up here. Who cares where they build it? Let's just get on with it and build the damn thing. At this time, we offer our candidates two minutes to give their closing argument. We start with Dave Matthews from the NDP party. Um, the only thing I, I can close with is this. This is the most important election that we're going to have probably in the next 20 or 30 years. On one hand, we have a, a government that is just ending its term, that wasted money, made cuts, did not support a good health system, did not support a good education system, uh, has put us in debt, was full of scandal. We have another party that wants to make cuts. No matter, they won't, they don't even have the guts to say where they're going to do it. We haven't seen a cost affected program that he has presented yet, and I don't know whether Doug Ford can be trusted. He sure as hell wasn't trusted in Toronto. So we need change. We need change that is actually going to work for people and to make your life more affordable. And I hope that you will vote NDP on June 7th. Thank you, David Matthews. Jim Wilson. So when they talk about uh, cuts, I have a bit of homework for you. On page 224 of the uh, Liberals' last budget, they have $1.4 billion in cuts each year for a total of $8 billion, over $8 billion for six years. Uh, that's where they get the $8 billion for my party, and yet we don't have the paper out yet. Uh, so our cuts would be the same as the Liberals. It's four cents on the dollar. I think we can find that. The auditor studied 14 programs just before Christmas, and she found a billion dollars without anybody losing their job, just doing things differently, doing it more efficiently. Um, the fact of the matter is the NDP on page 97 of their platform have $3 billion in cuts and it doesn't say over what time period. So everyone's got to find efficiencies to pay for the programs, to keep funding health care, to keep funding education, uh, to fund pharmacare. We all agree on that. Now that it's in, you can't take it away, and we're not planning on doing that. But, you know, I don't appreciate the Toronto media that when my party says efficiencies, or sorry, when they say efficiencies and year-end roundings, that's where it says on page 90, or 224 of $1.4 billion each year, and my party says the same thing, you guys all call it cuts. So I guess we're all cutting or we're all finding efficiencies. Thank you for being here and I do appreciate and ask for your support. Jessica Perry from the Green Party. Well, thank you again for everybody for coming out tonight. I hope you have all gained a helpful and healthy perspective of all our party platforms this evening. I just wanted to finish off by saying that, you know, 
it's, it sounds funny, but the time for change is now. And we can talk about, you know, our party's going to do it differently. This party is going to do it differently. Well, we all need to do it differently at the end of the day. That's the problem here. We need to end the era of this blind generational conservative voting. And we need to really consider where our votes are going. And we need to really be accountable for them because it's not your future and it's not my future. It's my kids' futures and our grandkids' futures that we need to really look out for. It's not just four years here, four years there, flip-flop between conservative and liberal, you know, for time on end. It's insane. We need a change. And momentum is shifting. We have Greens elected in PEI, New Brunswick, BC, and they hold the majority of the power and the balance of the power out in BC now. You can't make a decision without them. So I'm hoping that on June 7th, you will vote with your mind and you will vote green and you will join me in Queen's Park. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica Perry. Dan Hanley from the Liberal Party. And again, I'd like to say thank you for all, all for coming out uh, and uh, participating in this uh, very important um, um, uh, forum. Um, and I just want to uh, echo some of the things that uh, I said earlier. You know, I'm uh, I'm representing a government that has presided over uh, brilliant economic growth. I mean, we have 2.7% growth, uh, which outpaces all G7 countries. We have, a, you know, a huge GDP. Our, our GDP in Ontario is $800 billion. We're one of the richest societies in the world. And in a society like this, there is no reason that uh, seniors uh, shouldn't have dental care, that, uh, that we don't have things like childcare uh, to give uh, mothers options and fathers options. Um, that there's no reason why uh, a single mom shouldn't be able to afford accessible education. My own personal professional trajectory uh, can't be divorced from uh, access to uh, affordable education. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big champion of, of these issues. Um, I'm really, really afraid. I mean, this is, this is uh, I think, a, an election where the, the stark contrast is, is so apparent. Um, you know, if you look at Doug Ford's track record as a councillor in the city of Toronto, he cut. He cut public health spending. He cut infrastructure spending. Uh, when he appeared to vote, uh, it was it was invariably times to cut. And I mean, at least Tim Hudak in 2014 had the truth and the honesty to tell us he was going to cut 100,000 jobs. But Mike Moffat, the independent economist at the University of Western Ontario, said cuts are going to amount to about 40,000 jobs uh, under a Doug Ford government. The Globe and Mail a few weeks ago said upwards of 75,000 jobs. They're trying to backdoor it, and uh, I'm afraid of that. I mean, I, I believe strongly in, in these you, programs, and I support them. <laughs> I'd like you to uh, continue that applause and thank our outstanding candidates on behalf of the uh, Chamber of Commerce of Collingwood. Thank you very much, candidates. A thank you to our timekeepers tonight. And a big thank you to CollingwoodToday.ca, 951 The Peak FM, The Collingwood Connection, Rogers TV, and 97.7 The Beach for their cooperation in presenting this program to you. And the dedicated membership, of course, of the Collingwood Chamber of Commerce. Get out and vote on June 7th. From the beautiful Normandy Room at the, Col the Royal Canadian Legion in Collingwood, I'm John Eaton. Just a note, this show will be broadcast for the first time May 17th, 7 p.m. on Rogers Television. Thank you all for joining us. Good evening, everybody, and I'd like to just thank you all for being here. It's uh, an important thing that uh, we do uh, in an all candidates meeting. Uh, it's part of our democracy. It's, it's important that uh, uh, the message that each of us up here has to uh, bring to you is, is amplified uh, in this uh, forum. My name is Dan Hambly. I'm your liberal candidate for Simcoe Gray for the upcoming election in <coughs> June, and I strongly believe that it's time for a fresh perspective in Simcoe Gray. But let me tell you more precisely why I'm here. I'm here because the Liberal government has presided over an Ontario which has demonstrated outstanding economic growth, 
low unemployment, and is now making a conscious decision to invest in people. I personally believe that um, governments exist as a manifestation of our collective desire to make society better for people. And I believe that the greatness of any society uh, can be measured by the way in which it treats its most vulnerable people, the elderly, children, the sick, the poor, the oppressed, women. In Ontario, these groups, these people, have been the focus of a government aiming to level the playing field in, in our society. I'm willing and ready to work hard to gain your confidence. This election, I think we can see a stark contrast of visions. Ontarians will have to select between cuts and care. Doug Ford will cut education. He'll cut health care. He'll cut government spending and cut into the greenbelt all for his friends. Doug Ford is someone who doesn't believe in climate change. He doesn't believe that government should help provide affordable housing, and he believes that he can cut his way into greater prosperity. On the other side, the Liberal plans show completely opposite values and vision. Our Liberal team believes in the importance of education, by building new schools, by investing more in our classrooms, by hiring more teachers. And I spent my entire professional life in post-secondary education. You know, we invested in uh, 235,000 students for free tuition in colleges and universities, including 13,000 single mothers. And by offering free childcare to all preschoolers between the age of 2.5 and uh, kindergarten, we build a stronger Ontario with these types of policies. Our Liberal government will continue to invest more into our healthcare system because we know that cuts will diminish the quality of life for all Ontarians. This government has already built 24 hospitals, and we will continue to make strategic infra infrastructure investments to renovate and build almost 50 more. We will make sure that our community-based mental health services are available to all Ontarians. We will expand our Pharmacare program. We're the first jurisdiction in North America to offer free Pharmacare for groups for people under the age of 25, and we've extended that to people over 65. We're providing dental care to those without coverage. And we'll make sure that seniors have an opportunity to grow and, and, and grow old with dignity uh, in a safe and secure and compassionate environment uh, everywhere in the province. We believe that our comprehensive opioid strategy will help us put an end to the public health crisis that needs immediate action. A healthy Ontario means a stronger Ontario. Your Liberal team also believes that our way to prosperity as a province is not through cuts, but through strategic investment into what Ontarians hold dear. For the past four years, our plan of investing more in the economy has worked. Ontario has led all G7 countries when it comes to economic growth. It averages 2.7% average growth over the past four years. We have the lowest unemployment rate in a generation, 5.5%. And of course, we've added 400,000 jobs under this government's leadership. We also want Ontario to be a place where econo economic growth is inclusive and everyone can share in its benefit. That's why we've launched the Basic Income Pilot Project, which has you know, cross-partisan support, to bring support in, in our province to those who are striving for a better life. But on top of all that, these provincial issues, the region of Simcoe Gray needs more investment. We need more investment in public transit services. We need more affordable housing. We need more small and medium-sized businesses in the area. We need a new high school in Wasaga Beach. Uh, we need uh, new hospitals in our riding, both in, in Collingwood and in Alliston, for too long. In this area, we have been left behind. We deserve a strong voice in Toronto that will work hard for the priorities of Collingwood, Wasaga Beach, Blue Mountains, Clearview, Essa, New Tecumseh, Agila, Tosserantio. I'm here today to ask for your support because I strongly believe that it's time for a fresh perspective in Simcoe Gray. Tonight, I appreciate your support so much. Thank you. Glad to see everybody out here tonight supporting democracy and becoming engaged in local politics. I love it. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about the states. All I want to hear about is Ontario politics. Here, here. <laughs> so I just want to start the night off by telling you a little bit about why I choose to be involved with the Green Party. In my opinion, the Greens are a party that are moving towards where the puck is going and not where it's been. Greens do politics 
completely differently. We reject self-serving political games, accounting gimmicks, and empty promises. The Greens don't live in this fantasy land where climate change isn't an issue and our children's futures aren't a priority. In this election, the Greens are committed to a number of things. We want to make it affordable to make our homes and businesses energy efficient. We want to lower payroll taxes for local businesses. We want to ensure affordable housing. We want to provide access to mental health services. We want to implement a basic income. We want to protect our air, water, and farmland. We want to set Ontario on a pathway to 100% renewable energy. We need to invest in transit infrastructure and operations. And we also want to merge the public and Catholic school boards to create a quality education system. And you know, I love participating with the Green Party and I've been doing it for a number of years now. And the first way that I got involved with the Green Party was through the Young Greens of Canada. And I just love that the Green Party engages young voters. Like they really try hard to make it accessible for somebody young to figure out how to get involved in politics. It's time that we build a bridge that we can walk across with confidence, knowing that we have created a good future for our children. I myself have two young children, and I don't want to leave behind a province, a country that isn't sustainable for them. I, and I hope you will join me on June 7th in voting green and focusing on a future that is going to protect our children's needs and we can all do it together in a way that benefits all of us. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for uh, coming out tonight and participating in our democratic process. I think this election is one of the most uh, important elections that uh, the voters of Ontario have ever faced. My party has a great plan. We're focused on reducing hydro rates by an additional 12% and cleaning up the hydro mess cutting hospital wait times, putting money back into the pockets of taxpayers, job creation and restoring accountability and trust to the provincial government. In Simcoe Gray, I will continue to fight for the redevelopment of Collingwood General Marine Hospital and Stevenson Memorial Hospital in Alliston. It's time for these projects to move forward to ensure our residents receive the best possible health care now and in the future. Getting the hospitals the money to continue planning for the redevelopments is my top priority. Planning for the two projects is expected to cost about $14 million per hospital. So far, the Liberal government has promised just half a million dollars for each hospital. And that announcement was two months ago and the hospitals have yet to see a dime. We need to do better. My party is also promising to end hallway health care and we're committed to building 15,000 new long-term care beds in five years <coughs> and 30,000 new beds over the next 10 years. I talk often with officials at our hospitals and I know that they're stretched to their capacity. I also know about the crisis in long-term care all across the province. The wait list for beds is now at 32,000 people. If nothing is done by three years time, 2021, the wait list will be 50,000. Our government will fix the problem and create new beds to take the strain off our hospitals and reduce wait times. We also have to do better with our approach to hospice care. I'm committed to opening the four beds currently sitting idle here at Hospice Georgian Triangle. These beds are there, they're available, and they could help our citizens, but the government won't let them open, and that's just not right. They won't let them open even if the hospice pays for the operating costs themselves. I've also uh, committed to review the short-sighted and irresponsible decision to close the Ontario tree seed plant in Angus. Doug Ford supports uh, me in this matter. The Liberal government decided to close the facility with no warning and no, consider, no consult, consultation excuse me, with the experts, the community or industry. If I'm re-elected, we'll do a full review and look at all options to keep a treed seed plant at its current location in Angus. We're going to clean up the mess at Hydro One and use every tool available to remove Kathleen Wynne's six million dollar man and the entire board. We will put money back into your pockets by axing the carbon tax introducing a minimum wage tax credit and cutting electricity bills by an average for an average family by 12 percent. We'll restore responsibility, accountability and trust in government by conducting a fully independent outside audit of Kathleen Wynne's reckless spending. We'll bring jobs back to Ontario, stabilize industrial hydro rates, cut corporate income taxes to create jobs and to remain competitive with our neighbours and cut red tape and stifling regulation. The PC campaign uh, is campaigning for 
people like you and talking about issues that matter to you, like lowering hydro bills, bringing jobs back and improving health care. I think I've done a good job in the last number of years in this riding. I've been accountable, open and accessible. And on June 7th, the people of Ontario, I hope, will finally have a government that respects your tax dollars and focuses on the issues <coughs> and services that matter to real people. I respectfully ask for your support. First of all, I'd like to thank the Chamber of Commerce and the media for putting this together so that we can use the democratic process to its fullest. Our policy, our, our party, wants a change for the better in Ontario. For the last 25 years, we have been flip-flopping between Liberal and Conservatives. And when one looks at what has happened in this province, nobody is further ahead. Under the Conservative government, we saw 24 hospital close, 6,000 nurses laid off. We have never recovered from that. No, ma no matter what either the Conservatives or Liberals say, we still have not recovered from that. And how can you trust Doug Ford when this is a man who believes in cuts? The first, the, our two biggest budget expenditures are education and hospitals, and they are the two areas where he will make his cuts to make his $6.1 billion <clears throat> that he wants to use. I, I honestly believe, you know, that as a government, our tax dollars should be going to services. They should not be going to corporations. Doug Ford and the Conservatives have openly stated they are going to cut corporation tax by another 1.5%. These are the richest co companies in this province, and they're not paying their fair share. He's also stated that he wants to kill the carbon tax, something that he has not the power to do, because the federal government is going to enforce that. And I would sooner see my tax dollars go to Ontario than to the federal government. The one thing that I would like to see, and I hope Jim can answer this question tonight, is where they're going to make their cuts. Under the Harris government, he was right up front about it, where he's going to make his cuts. You know, Tim Hudak, even though he wasn't elected, still came through with where he was going to make his cuts. Well, I would like to know, and I think everybody in Ontario would like to know, where Doug Ford is going to make his cuts. He's lowering corporate taxes. He's going to lower the taxes of middle-income people. This is all revenue that we have to have for services, so something has to go. Our party thinks the direct opposite. Our platform is roughly the same as the Liberals, but unlike the Liberals, we are going to act on this stuff. The Liberals have had 15 years to clean up our hospitals so pe patients aren't being treated in hallways. They have done nothing. They brought in free education to 20% of the people that live in Ontario. We're going to change that and make post-secondary education free for everybody, which it should be. They brought in pharmacare for 20% of the people in Ontario. If you're not under 25, you don't get it. We're bringing it in for everybody. We're also going to bring in denture care. These are all programs that are going to help people. We're going to help seniors. We're going to make their lives better. We're going to open up senior like homes for them. We're, going, we're all kinds of things. The Liberals have talked this for years, and they've never acted on it. If you were to really look at what they've done, they did, uh, under uh, funded the hospitals last year, our medical system, by $300 million, turned around and claimed that they put money in. But they cut services. If you, uh, any uh, people that have children that need services have found that they've been dropped off. We can't have this. We need those services. That's what our tax dollars are for. The Liberals have abused that. They've wasted money. They've uh, tried to, uh, excuse, <coughs> excuse me. They've taken money out of education. It's a shame when, you're, when the teachers in these schools have to buy supplies with their own money. We pay a lot of taxes, and I'd like to know where this money is going. We want to change all that. We've seen the Liberals' actions this, this week by closing the seed plant and not telling anybody, and really no reason for, cleaning, for closing it. You know, the, we have a lot of um, for nonprofit organizations that plant seeds. They buy them there. The Wynn government has decided they can go to the private enterprise, private companies, to make money to buy these seeds. This is unacceptable. 
The other thing is Mr. Ford wants to sell marijuana in the corner stores where we want to make sure that it's strictly governed. Thank you, and I hope that I can get your support come June the 7th. program is brought to you by Rogers Anyplace TV. Enjoy exclusive content for free. Visit RogersAnyplaceTV.com. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media.